My name is Tom Carpinitz. Um, I'm going to be speaking about privacy and surveillance. This is a topic I've been interested in for a number of years. Um, I think I'm the only person I've noticed so far at the conference who has a bit of tape over their webcam. Is, is, is that true? Has anyone else here got one person? Wonderful. Awesome. Anyway, that's, that's not that important, but anyway. Um, I got interested in around 2007 when uh, the internet filtering scheme first raised its head in Australia and after several years looking into this stuff I last year volunteered with Electronic Frontiers Australia who is a, um, they're a digital rights advocacy organisation in Australia and I was chair of their policy and research committee. Um, if that sounds like an exciting job, trust me it isn't. I spent most of my time reading things, a lot of them were pretty silly. Um, and I had to try to explain why they were silly without sounding too silly myself. So while I, while I was in this role, the government produced three pieces of new national, national security legislation, um, some of which were pretty interesting to us. We participated in the uh, Senate inquiry process, um, which is a public feedback consultation process. If any of you have, are not familiar with Senate inquiries, Imagine being in the comment section on news.com.au. It's like that except everyone's using longer words and the moderators generally support the government. So uh, there were lots of interesting things to read. And the trouble with digital rights and privacy and surveillance is that they are genuinely tricky issues. It's an uncomfortable mix of technology, ethics and law and it's very easy to get carried away regardless of what your actual political persuasion is. I myself have said many silly things in the past including once on national TV. Thanks Q&A. But we pick ourselves up and we try to explain ourselves better and that's at least one reason why I'm, I'm here today to talk to you about my, uh, my experiences. We in this room are broadly speaking technologists. We make technology, cool things for ourselves and other people to achieve things. And we presumably care about our own privacy and our users' privacy, but if we don't really know what we're trying to protect, it becomes more likely that we're just going to get caught up in silly arguments rather than actually solving problems that matter. So my goals for today, I want to show you some perspectives on privacy that you might not have seen before. I hope that they'll aid, aid your thinking when you're looking at privacy in the future. It might even be wheels for the mind. <clears throat> Having established some clarity around that, we'll look at, look at um, a couple of mass surveillance programs, one Australian, one international, um, and also talk about some things that you can do yourself. So let's start off with a little audience survey. Hands up, who here is actually worried about online mass surveillance? Okay, that's pretty much most people here, cool. Thank you. Um, question two, who here has with them a smartphone that is turned on? We're a dev world, right? Yeah, go figure. Um, so, this is my iPhone. I have one too. It has a sensitive microphone, two cameras, GPS accelerometer, 4G internet connection that can talk to any of millions of computers all around the world, whenever and wherever it wants. It has all of my text messages, all of my email, every password, uh, various health metrics, and every photo I took in the last decade of my life. And I choose to rely upon this for my everyday life. It's closed source and locked down. Apart from being able to choose which apps I install on it, I don't actually have direct control over what code does and does not run on this phone. I've basically surrendered that control to Apple. This is one of the most sophisticated spying devices that humankind has ever created and I just choose to carry it around. Don't we look foolish? I imagine right now someone's tweeting this presenter says we shouldn't use phones. I think he's at the wrong conference. But I'm not going to say that. And this is, what, this is what I'm getting at. We might seem like hypocrites or it might seem like we simultaneously do and don't care about privacy, but, but that's not true. It's just that we recognise that it's, it's more complicated than that. There is, it's not that our behaviour is wrong. It's that we're not defining the problem clearly. And then it seems like it doesn't make sense. So let's look at a, a second example. Imagine there is a couple and they have iPhones and every night they send each other naughty pictures on Snapchat. So to be clear, they're taking naked photos of themselves using phones they do not control and they're sending that over the internet 
via a whole bunch of untrusted third parties. Crazy, right? But at the same time, when you Snapchat, you're sending it to an individual. The person who's sending the photo does have an expectation of privacy. They expect that only the person they chose will see it. And if somebody else ended up getting that photo, they'd probably be unhappy. They'd probably feel like their privacy had been betrayed. Now, the question is, is that reasonable? And I think there's probably three ways you could respond to this. And I think there's good arguments for all of them. Number one, that is totally OK. You, you have your expectation of privacy, and if someone you know, doesn't respect that, we'll hit them with the full force of the law, right? Well, number two, the uh, pragmatic victim-blaming option. Yes, that should be OK, but there's bad, unaccountable people out there like hackers and so on, and they'll probably you know, cause you a lot of trouble and you won't really be able to catch them, blah, blah, blah. Just don't do it. And then number three, uh, you deserve everything you get, you idiot. Um, I'm interested to know what you guys think again here. Who, who thinks number one? That's totally OK. Quite a few of you. Number two? Only a couple. Number three? OK, that was not what I was expecting. I was expecting more number twos. So that was mostly number ones and a few number threes. Anyone thinking something else? Is that you, said? Asking if one and three are mutually exclusive. Well, number one, you're saying that. That's, a, that's an interesting question. I, don't, I, guess, I guess it's saying whether you, whether you think that if you were in that position you would do that or not. One, you're saying, yeah, I'd be cool with that. Number three, you're saying, no, I don't think I would. Well, at least that's the way I'm looking at it. Moving on. We know that Western companies provide us with uh, services for free, and in exchange for that, they're using our data in various ways, particularly for marketing and advertising. We know, mostly thanks to Edward Snowden, that uh, the Five Eyes intelligence agencies routinely spy on both their own citizens and foreigners um, for their own purposes. And you also know, if you were watching the news when the Snowden revelations came out, that most Australians don't actually care about this a lot. It's not really a big deal for them. And, you know, if you, if you sort of step back, take off your tinfoil hat and Look, use some common sense, you can sort of understand why maybe there might be some people using Snapchat to send naked photos and it, it's not such a big deal for them. And imagine you're, doing a, you're inside their head and they're doing a risk assessment of this, right? They might, these various people might see my naked photos. Like, okay, so the police might see, might see my photo. Okay, that's not really a big deal. The NSA might store it in a database. That's a little bit creepy, but they're looking for terrorists. Woohoo, that's okay. Um, Snapchat staff might see it, good for them. Um, but if my parents see it, or if it got leaked and then it got shared on Facebook and I was tagged, that would be pretty much the end of the world right there. So it doesn't necessarily have to affect you if somebody completely anonymous sees your naked photo. And the moral of the story is that privacy depends, the, the threat of privacy depends on who is going to see the information. The people in our hypothetical example still value their privacy quite a lot. It's just not the kind of privacy where they're hiding from the government. And what these two examples show us, the, the phone example and the Snapchat example, is that the concept of privacy is quite difficult to pin down. It has a bunch of different factors to it. And if we split it out, split it out into even more of them, if you're all considering whether you're going to be scared of a privacy threat or not, it's going to depend on what the information is, who's going to see it, how likely it is that they're going to see it, and also a personal care factor, which I'll talk about in a moment. What this means is if somebody is or isn't worried about a particular privacy threat and you're trying to understand why that is, it's important not to assume which reason it is. It could be any one of these things that has them reaching the conclusion that, OK, it's OK, or no, that's really bad. And if you don't get clear on that, you're going to end up arguing across each other, and this happens a lot. Now, that care factor is what I've called a whole bunch of different things which are related to the individual. It depends on your job. If you've got particularly sensitive jobs, you might care a lot about who sees your uh, online communications, for example. It can include your personal eth ethics, your attitudes towards the internet, uh, who your family and friends are, and your life experiences as well. So, for an example, if I were to create a, a tweet here at DevWorld and include my accurate GPS coordinates, 
I would be totally fine with that. I wouldn't feel unsafe in any way putting that on the public internet. However, if one of you in the recent past had a stalker, for example, you might be really scared to do exactly that same thing. And what's more, that is completely valid. Even though it's not an issue at all for me, it is a serious privacy threat for you. What this means is that, in general, only you can decide what is a privacy threat for you. If you turn that around, that means that you can't make assumptions about what will or won't be a privacy threat for somebody else. Now, that makes our life quite difficult as technologists who make websites and platforms and apps. How are we supposed to help people protect their privacy if everybody wants different things? Believe it or not, we've actually just stumbled across a useful definition of privacy which might help us solve some of these problems. Privacy is having control over who gets what information when. It's as simple as that. I'm going to make that bigger and in red because I think it's important. <laughs> Privacy is having control over who gets what information when. The key word here is control. It's not necessarily about hiding your location from the government. It's not necessarily about keeping your bank statements secret. It's not necessarily about having curtains on your house or any of these other examples you hear in sort of facetious arguments about privacy on the internet. It's about having the ability to pick and choose and to change your mind if you want to. If someone complains about a threat to privacy, what they're complaining about is that they have lost control over their information. And if you say to that person, you're an idiot for thinking that this is a privacy threat, what you're saying to them is you don't deserve to have the choice. You don't deserve to have that control over who does and does not get that information about you. Obviously, we can't all have control over all of our information all of the time because if that was true, we wouldn't be able to enforce the law. In society, we have to make certain trade-offs, but I think it's useful to think about it in this way. If somebody has good control over their information, fine-grained control, they understand what their controls are and it's easy to use, then that's a person who has good privacy. Now, when I say that, you prob it probably conjures up an image of something like the privacy settings on Facebook. You know, you've got lots of little dials and gadgets and whatnot that let you choose, okay, this person can see these things, this person can see these things, and so on. That's really good. That's really empowering. And, you know, if, as long as people understand how to use it, that's really good. But Privacy settings are, fall under the category of technological solutions to privacy. And I'm sort of put them in the same basket as things like encryption. And there's also a whole bunch of non-technological aspects which I would encourage you to think about. So here's an example to illustrate that. Suppose you're really into free speech, like you really love free speech, and you're going to set up a discussion forum and it's going to be so private that everyone can use all the free speech they want. So, you know, you don't need an email address to sign up. Everything's going to be encrypted and you don't keep any logs. What this means is that they can talk about what they like and if the police come knocking on your door, you're not going to have any information to give to the police um, to identify who those users were. Free speech, yeah. Anyway, you launch this website and everything's going great until someone uses it to dox someone. So for those who are not uh, familiar with this, doxing is where there's some target. They may be an online figure, they might not be. Some people have decided they don't like the target, so some troublemakers dig up all the personal information they can about that person, either by stalking them or scavenging around online, things like their, their name, their address, their employer, their email addresses, their phone numbers and so on, and then they publish that information onto some sort of forum or pastebin or website, and then a whole bunch of other anonymous troublemakers can use that information to harass that person, make them miserable order them pizza, sign them up for spam, that sort of business. And in this case, you've made a discussion forum in which, in which the people who are collecting the information know that you're so committed to free speech that you, you won't be able to identify them. You won't delete their posts. And the deep irony in all this is that your commitment to privacy, technological privacy measures, has enabled a privacy breach far more damaging than any of the things you were actually trying to protect against in the first place. Now, this is a made-up example, but if you've been following, you know, discussions around policies on Reddit and, you know, the existence of 4chan and so on, you realise that this is, you might realise that this is actually fairly close to reality. This is, this, is a, this is a real problem that we have to somehow come up with solutions to. And I'm going to put a, an opinion out here just for, just for food for thought. 
in my opinion, if you run a discussion forum without an anti-harassment policy, without active moderation, then that is as bad for privacy as having a login system that is unencrypted. So that's, you might not agree with me with that, but I think that, I think it might, it's a good idea to think more broadly, if you can, about what privacy means in terms of all aspects of the product you create and the, the kinds of harm that can follow from that. Now I've been talking about privacy for a while, let's have a look at surveillance. In particular, internet mass surveillance. So I'm not so worried about the mass surveillance where you know they, they think they found a terrorist and they're putting them under watch and so on. That's very particularised and that's, a, that's all right. What I'm worried about is the kind of surveillance where they're collecting information about everyone all the time and it's, they're not necessarily um, suspected of a crime. And often it's the case that no judicial warrant is required for agencies to obtain access to the data that's being collected under these regimes. So first up I want to talk about the Australian Metadata Retention Scheme which passed into law earlier this year. The kinds of data that they want to collect are things like financial information, all the payments you made to your ISP, um, all of the sources and destinations of communications, email addresses, phone numbers, times, durations, um, and the locations that the communications took place. So this applies to telecommunications providers and ISPs, so it will include things like your mobile phone location, as far as they can find it from their cell towers. And they want to hold all of this information at this stage for a minimum of two years. If this seems kind of vague, it is. Unfortunately, the full specifications that were published by the Attorney General's Department are not much clearer. Um, ISPs in general don't really know what they have to do at this point, despite it being law. That's a bit awkward. Um, things we do know, though, your, I, your IP address when you connect to the internet, as allocated by your ISP, will be retained. The IP addresses of the websites you connect to will not, um, and the locations will be included when you send messages and make phone calls and so on from your phone. But it gets weird. If you're using an internet email address, because you're with internet and you decide to use their at on.net or whatever it is address, they will have to retain full metadata of every email message you send and receive. If you use an Australian email provider who isn't a telecommunications provider, like Fastmail for example, they don't have to retain anything. If you use a foreign service, they can just sit back and laugh at the whole thing. And this is, this is what's kind of incredible about Australian data retention, and this comes up again and again and again, whether it's um, internet filtering or site blocking or data retention. Uh, they try, they're dabbling in doing really serious stuff, but really sucking at it. And it's, it's really tempting when you're sort of advocating against these measures to attack them on the basis that they don't even achieve their goals. But at the same time, this is really dangerous because really you're just daring them to come up with something so totalitarian that it actually works, right? <laughs> so I prefer to stick to principles and say, okay, this is actually a bad idea whether it works or not. So with that in mind, let's have a look at one aspect of data retention that is actually genuinely difficult to circumvent, and that is the location tracking of your mobile phone. You know, I talked about sort of a dichotomy earlier where you either care about your privacy or you... You know, you have to turn off your phone or not have a phone if you care about your privacy. And that is actually true for this kind of data collection because there's no way of getting around it. Timestamp location records reveal a lot of information about you, you know, where you live, where you work and so on. This particular heat map is from a page that was recently published by the ABC. One of their reporters, Will Ockenden, managed to receive a whole bunch of data from Telstra, which included all of his call information and location data. They put it all into lovely maps and... You know, they invited the, pu invited the public to try and figure out what he does in his life. It was, most, it was very revealing, both in terms of what information they were able to guess correctly and also what things they guessed incorrectly by misinterpreting the data. And this kind of information is classified as telecommunications data under the Telecommunications Intercept and Access Act. What that means is that you don't need a warrant to access it, as long as you're an authorised uh, agency. So the police departments around Australia are the sort of primary users of this data, we think, 
they make about 250,000 requests for this kind of data every single year. Remember that we have about 23 million people in Australia. I'm not sure what all the requests are actually for. And those figures do not include ASIO because they are exempt from reporting under this scheme. So, and that's before we have data retention. So who knows what that, what that figure is going to become later. It also becomes a juicy target for hackers. Like imagine, imagine someone who's under a witness protection scheme. There might be cashed up people overseas who want to know where that person happens to be. Or they might be running away from a foreign criminal gang. Or there might be someone who has a jealous ex who's a police officer and they're worried that they're going to get looked up by that person who works for the police force and has that access. Or even imagine an advertising company who, you know, maybe they've got a database of people's phone numbers who they're marketing to, targeting ads. And they would really like to know what city each person lives in. And if someone came to them and said, I can give you that information, as long as you don't ask any questions, maybe they'd do that. You might be lucky enough not to care about whether the government knows your location, but there are people who have legitimate fears. You've probably heard this before. If you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. My hope is that at this point this seems perhaps a little bit simplistic, a little bit selfish, because it's not true for everyone. I want to move to another surveillance scheme. This one, one of the ones which was revealed by the Snowden leaks. It's called Tempora. And this one is run out of Britain. It's basically an eavesdropping system in overdrive. So Britain has a lot of the world's undersea fibre optic cables enabling worldwide internet connectivity running through it. And they have tapped into a lot of them and, and they analyse all of the content that's flowing through them. At the, according to the reports that were produced by The Guardian, they were able to record up to three days of content and 30 days of metadata of all of the traffic that was flowing through them. And according to the notes, they were able to get phone calls, email messages, even Facebook messages. I don't even know how they were doing that. And the history of... Um, people's URLs of websites they are accessing in general. What that means for us is that if we make an app or a website, particularly if we're doing requests that sort of traverse the globe, there's a very, very strong chance that all of those requests are going to be subjected to some level of Five Eyes analysis as they go. So if you have some request or some system in your app, for example, that you know, maybe uses Facebook to log on and it downloads some assets from AWS US East, and maybe it sort of picks out the profile pictures of people you're interacting with and downloads them from Gravatar. If you've got all of those requests flying off around the planet and they're all tied to the same user's IP address, it's very easy for that to all get joined together again by somebody who's watching those requests take place. So we have responsibilities in this area too. Data retention, uh, yeah, data retention and tempora together reduce our privacy because they take away our control. We're losing the right to choose who has, in fact, quite a lot of information about us, including our locations, including all of the websites we visit in the case of these international efforts. There's no such thing as harmless mass surveillance when you look at it in that way. We're always trading something off, and we want to be really clear on what we're giving away and what we're getting in return when we are trying to establish things like new surveillance systems to improve national security. So there are some, if we want to do something about this, we have, you know, general technical techniques. You should probably talk to Louis Gremmen if you want to do this properly. There's just some basic suggestions. You know, maybe you want to aggregate requests and forward them on behalf of your users so their IP addresses are not on top of everything. But your homework is to visit the Apple privacy website, apple.com slash privacy. Now, I'm not just saying this because I'm at an AUC conference. A Apple is one of the most exciting companies in the sort of digital privacy area at the moment, just because of how much work they put into protecting end users' privacy and protecting against government surveillance, often without the end users even realising that it's happening. You know, they use anonymous profiles for Siri. They could be easily tied to your iCloud account. They just don't. They don't want to do that. They encrypt everything they can. They delete unneeded data as soon as it goes out of date. There are problems with Apple, of course. They're closed source. That means that they, the public cannot audit their code. And sometimes they're not always the best at dealing with security researchers who find vulnerabilities in their products. However, they're on our side. And look at what they've done for SMS, for example. 
with data retention coming up, every SMS message in Australia is suddenly going to have its sender, receiver and timestamp recorded for everyone who's using SMS. Everyone who's using iMessage, on the other hand, will be using end-to-end -end encryption over the internet. That's a phenomenal number of messages that Apple has suddenly saved from data retention. It's good. So I do recommend that when you're doing a privacy analysis of your product, you use, look to companies like Apple for inspiration. Now, the problem is that companies have to follow the law. Now, that's a good thing. But even, you know, Internode, which is sort of the sweetheart of the Australian tech community, is right now figuring out how to implement data retention, right? They, they have to do it. There's not much respect for digital privacy in Australia right now. The status quo lets us down because we've never had so much of our digital lives online before. We don't have a good reference point for public policy in this area. We need, what we need is, to use a corny phrase, to win hearts and minds in terms of individuals actually caring about their own privacy rights and not letting go of this control over their information willy-nilly. To do that, we need to work in the areas of public policy and politics. You, Icky, we don't like that, right? Can't we solve it with code? Unfortunately not. We need to ask politicians the difficult questions. We need to have mature discussions which really break down privacy threats like I was talking about before and understand what the costs are and what we're getting in return. And there are things you can do. You can, you know, you can, uh, you can talk to your friends, you can talk to your family, you can write good software, and if you're really passionate about it, there are a whole bunch of organisations you can volunteer with as well, groups like Electronic Frontiers Australia, the Australian Privacy Foundation, um, or even the New South Wales Council for Civil Liberties, you know, good groups who are trying to improve the standing of these kinds of issues in sort of the public awareness. And from that, good policy and less need for sort of companies working against, against governments will follow. And that's a, really, that's a really good thing for everyone. Basically, Apple can only hold back the politicians for so long. We have some work to do as well. Thanks for listening.